because what you don't know about energy can kill you. Here's Alex Epstein. Welcome to Power Hour. I'm Alex Epstein. Well, we're at the end of March. We're heading into an April in which the Biden administration is expected or basically guaranteed to announce even more massive controls on our economy, wealth transfers, et cetera, uh, in the name of stopping climate catastrophe. And what they've even acknowledged is that what they call a crucial framework for this is, quote, the Green New Deal. And coincidentally, I know of an expert on particularly the politics of climate catastrophe who's been studying this for decades, and he has a new book out. His name is Mark Morano. The book is Green Fraud, Why the Green New Deal is Even Worse Than You Think. So I thought I would bring on Mark to uh, explain what the Green New Deal is and what the movement behind it is and where it's going. So Mark, welcome back to Power Hour. Thank you, Alex. I'm happy to be here today. I appreciate it. And it's, it's good to see you in your outdoor environment. So where are you exactly? I'm in suburban DC area in Virginia, suburban Virginia outside of DC, uh, sucking up the nature. It's about, it'll be about 60 degrees and sunny here today with slight gusts of wind, which the climate activists tell us both increased wind and decreased winds can be a result of global warming. So yes, and they can have it both ways fail to generate wind power. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> too much or too little. Um, yeah. And I don't know if you know this, I grew up in Chevy Chase, Maryland. So right. Outside. Yes, I did that right outside yes. DC. And I, I think I first met you at the Heartland Institute conference in 2011. So uh, that would make sense. Yeah. And then we were, so just, and then the New York city climate March too. That's when the people were trying to rip your signs down. That was great stuff. Oh, right. Yeah. You were, uh, you were there too. Yeah. That was, uh, that was quite yeah. an eventful thing. So <laughs> let's, we, I interviewed you on power hour must've been four years ago or so. So I want to start off with some of what we covered back then, but how did you get interested in these issues? Because you do have a unique background, I think, particularly in terms of how on the ground you've been in observing the climate catastrophe movement. Well, thanks. Yeah, I started, you know, I was born in Washington, D.C., same hospital as Al Gore was born in, the Columbia Hospital for Women. It's now a defunct hospital. And the women part was our mothers were both women. So even though we we're both men, we were born in the hospital for women. Um, but I grew up uh, in McLean, Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C., and went to Langley High School right next door to the Central Intelligence Agency. And so I've always been politically active, involved. Uh, I, was, uh, I was a volunteer of Ronald Reagan's campaign in 1980. Actually, one of my first tastes of politics and uh, entertainment was getting Ronald Reagan sound bites when he was running in the fall of 1980 and sending them to radio stations. We had these big clunky machines. You'd call up a producer and say, I have Governor Reagan's latest sound bite, uh, you know, on the hostage crisis or Iran. Or and then you'd send them and play them over. So that's where I started getting involved in the media and activism it was sort of all boiled into one. But anyway, I grew up, you know, as a Reagan Republican, if you will, but I was always dissenting on environmental issues. And I remember James Watt. I remember the media portrayal I always liked nature, the environment, fishing. I always wanted to be a forest ranger, go out in the woods. I thought that would be my career. I remember filling out a survey one time where that was one of the jobs that came up. But I always was worried when James Watt was depicted as against the environment. I remember him putting in logging roads uh, into the, our forests, and I thought that was going to be horrible. So I just never really paid much attention or anything. But I had sort of my epiphany in the early 90s, and it was actually listening to Dixie Lee Ray, the old nuclear physicist, uh, talking about the Amazon rainforest, where she was talking about it being in, in most intact forest. And I started doing research on the Amazon because that was where I really got caught up. I used to watch the documentaries, the chain, I vividly recall the chainsaws being cut and the monkeys and animals all watching as the jungle disappeared beneath them. And I ended up, that was my epiphany. I started investigating that, which led to an Amazon rainforest documentary uh, and which debunked the myths called Clear Cutting the Myths, Amazon Rainforest. And I think because of that, by the time I started looking at global warming, I was already a skeptic and I felt like I'd been had by the environmental community all those years. So I started looking at all green skeptical. And even I worked for Rush Limbaugh, the television show, and I used to go to the animal rights march. I used to go to the environmental marches. I mean, I would see the activist base. I was interviewing them all, just sort of getting information from a political entertainment way, working for Rush Limbaugh. I have a memory of interviewing one animal rights activist. Uh, who wanted to ban the construction of all new roads because too many animals were getting hit by roadkill. And they were literally, this is what the activist base. And I started realizing this is, there's a disconnect in reality. A guy sees some animals on the side of the road. So he wants to ban all further road building. He was probably one of the moderates because he didn't want to 
destroy existing roads. But this is how the activists foment. And then they lead to policies ultimately like the Green New Deal. It's a detachment from reality and, and, and absurdity, but these activists end up winning the day. And then fast forward from the 90s to today, you have that kind of thought, the people who want to ban roads because of animals, same kind of thought, ruling corporate boards on every issue, but now even particularly climate, energy, and environment. So that's how I got involved. And uh, the, the Amazon rainforest was probably my big epiphany moment when I turned against the green movement. I want to ask specifically about the climate conferences. So when did you yes. start attending these and what have you noticed about the evolution or retrogression or whatever? Yeah, of these? <laughs> yeah my first one was the uh, Re uh, Earth Summit in uh, Re uh, Johannesburg, South Africa, 2002. And so it's pretty much for the last 19 years straight, I've been to every single conference, maybe minus one or two. I don't even know if I missed two, but maybe one I missed. And I'm going, planning to go in this year to the, to the Scotland the Oh yeah, I want, to talk, I want to talk to you about that at some point because I'm, I may have a book coming out then, so I'm considering going as well. So we should talk offline. Okay, sure. How to do that uh, as well. Yeah, there'll be a lot of different events. But so what I learned at these conferences is this is the, this is the conference. Well, first thing you learn is this is a giant United Nations party. Now, when I say, you know, I've been to these UN confabs in Cancun, in Rio de Janeiro, in um, yeah, Bali, in Paris, uh, in Kenya, on Safari. I mean, you name it, these are lavish spectacles. The airports literally get jammed up with the private jets from the government leaders, Hollywood celebrities, and wealthy people like the Al Gore, Bill Gates, et cetera. And there even have been articles on you know the food. They fly in chefs, they do caviar and uh, champagne, and they're, they're, they're just lavish parties every night. And there's even been analysis that these, and even in the African ones, they had them in Kenya and South Africa, that the carbon footprint, so-called, is actually larger than many of the African nations just for these two-week UN confabs. And they build little temporary structures and they just, yes. anyway, so that's the is first thing no, you need I to mean, understand. I'm just, I'm not even a big person in pointing out hypocrisy, but I'm just curious, is there any shame there? Because you, the whole <laughs> rhetoric, the whole rhetoric is literally like, we're going to go out of existence, right? The planet is getting right. Gonna an unlivable place. You would think if you were worried about that, it would be more like these cults that think the world is going to end. They're not having lavish parties every night. They're exactly. Having... No, you're right. They are actually more true to their beliefs, so to speak. Yeah, no, there's absolutely none. I mean, they don't even try. Uh, you know, even when you see things like World Economic Forum and Davos, I mean, they'll come in and talk with Prince uh, Andrew. Prince Andrew gave a, a barefoot speech on climate change, but they had flown in private jets. They have yachts out there. I mean, they're just, they've, they have no gene ability to detect hypocrisy. So that's the first thing you understand. But, but these UN summits, there, there's you know, tens of thousands of people depending on the year. And it's all it is, is the delegates getting together and they're just pressuring world governments. And one of the interesting things, and I've interviewed the development activists from Africa, the one I went to in Johannesburg, uh, actually was it was Durban, South Africa, 2011 or 12. I'm forgetting the year now. I believe it was 2011. But you see in real time how they get the developing world, which has nothing to gain, at least you know, from a material sense from the UN Climate Summit, how they get them on board, how they get all the African leaders, how they get the countries with one billion or so people without running water, electricity in Asia, South America to sign on. And they do it through these UN climate funds. They do it through essentially paying off these third world, which is a politically incorrect term, these developing world uh, terms, uh, developing world leaders not to develop. I interviewed Leon Lowe, uh, who you may have heard of. He's a, he was a, actually a, a, a friend of Ayn Rand at the time. He's a libertarian, but he's an, a South African development activist. And he said the UN is paying countries to be poor and the countries that are most, best able to keep their countries in poverty get the most aid and you see how they can bring on the developing world to what's completely against their interests other than making them welfare recipients to promise un you know transfer of money as as the rest of the world the world uh, world bank stops development loans you can't put coal plants they won't de they'll defund them as obama administration was doing so they're not even able, able to get the money so these conferences are all designed as Total group think the earlier conferences allowed skepticism. I actually got to debate the former IPCC chair, Rajenda Pachari in 2006 in Kenya. They actually allowed, we were on the same stage and we debated, Associated Press covered it. You could never have that now. And years later, I was actually uh, thrown out. By the time Trump came, 
I did a cardboard cutout with Trump and a paper shredder, which, you know, looking back, I guess you, I probably stepped on a lot of uh, sensibilities, but I shredded the UN Paris document. This was November 2016. Within about a minute and a half, and it's all on video, UN climate cops armed were called in. The media snitched me out. They called, the, they, they called in the security and they escorted me out into the desert in Morocco. This was in the... Uh, in Morocco, and literally I had to walk, I was wandering in the desert, I had dress shoes on in the sand because it was a little temporary platform uh, station built out there. But that's the kind of what, how things have changed. They used to allow you to debate the head of it, and then later you can't even hold an impromptu press conference with a cardboard cut out of Trump, and they threw me out into the sand. And then even after they threw me out, they sent over armed guards to go through my briefcase and commandeer it, and they took out all my documents and press releases related to me shredding the Paris Agreement. And there was no civil rights it's no way to appeal this. They took it all. Uh, and then they banned us from the conference and they permanently banned us. And we had to go through a whole petition thing, which sadly, I'm here to say, involved me basically signing something saying I was sorry for, uh, you know, for violating some technical rule of how to do a, a proper press conference, which had been going on all week and no one had been called. Anyway, but you get an idea of what these are like. Group think, no dissent. If dissent's allowed, you're thrown out. But essentially, it's a it's a party. It's a way for activists to connect, and it's how they advance and put pressure on this agenda of the of the UN international climate agenda. I think we had a, a guest several months ago, a guy named Joaquim Book. Uh, I forget where he's based, somewhere in Europe. And he was mentioning he went to he became somewhat of a convert to my side of things. But he, yeah. he went to one of these things, and he talked about just this fervor about like, oh, we're saving the world. Do you get a yes. sense? of that when you go to these things? Oh yes, if you go, there's an NGO center, which is all of the environmental groups from Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, on down to ones you've never heard of, to international ones. And there is a sense of just, you know, these people are set up booth and it's not so much that the people who set up the booth, but it's the volunteers and the young people, they bring in all the college students. There is such a belief that what they're doing there is not only like right morally and ethically, but it's a religious fervor where if you challenge or question it, you belong out, you're evil, you're wrong. I've had impromptu, uh, Kevin Anderson, you may have heard it from the Tyndale Center. He's the man who's called for planned recessions to fight global warming, part of the degrowth movement. He watched one of my talks, this would be 2014 in Poland, which was one of the lesser ones. They, they've had it in Poland in, in late November, or early December, which is not a fun place to go compared to you know, Bali or South America. But Kevin Anderson would come up, if you gave a speech, first of all, you could, you'd be heckled. Second of all, he would come up afterward. We had impromptu debates in the hallway. I mean, screaming, shouting. These were, this is like someone, this is someone attacking your religion. That's how they treated me as though I was a heretic or not even a heretic, but you know, a, uh, some kind of uh, you know, satanic thing if they're representing Christianity. They, this was how it goes. And we've also had events, I did it with, um, uh, at, with scientists at the, this was in Peru, I believe, where they, the UN agrees to give us a forum. And then 10 minutes into our talk out of like a 45 or 50 minute talk, they cut us off and say, John Kerry needs the room. And they literally have security usher us out, but they technically gave us a room. They just didn't let us finish. And this was part of the written agreement. So they did all kinds of things. They don't let you speak, but there is that fervor of the activists, of the activist base there, and it is absolute. And then you get the funny stuff like, well, yeah, we had to fly in here, but it's worth flying into this UN conference and, you know, South, South America in order to save the planet. It's just what we have to do. So they give themselves an immediate, uh, you know, it, 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 they give themselves a pass on any of their behavior that they're trying to ban everyone else from doing. Yeah, I mean, one way I put that phenomenon is their, their view is like, oh, well, what we're doing is really important. So yeah, well, we can get away with it, yes. Of course. And, and then the point is, oh, yeah, to do important things, you actually need to emit CO2. Like that's the exactly. Um, yeah, they need to admit it so they can lock us down. So we're not allowed to admit it. And that's what John Kerry said. His work was too important to fly commercial. Remember when he went to Iceland on a private jet to get uh, environmental work. <laughs> right. OK, so let's let's go to the Green New Deal then. So I guess what is the Green New Deal and how is it related to this, you know, global climate catastrophe movement of the past 30 plus years? Great question. And that's where I go in great detail in one key chapter where I try to trace the whole origin. But they ostensibly say it's based on Roosevelt's New Deal was the original thing. And interestingly enough, the Green New Deal is all into environmental justice and blaming white supremacy for climate change because our nation, you know, a white 
the nation with slavery passed and segregation presided over the industrial revolution and therefore we need climate reparations and anything we've done is now racist. But essentially I went back and looked at the Green New Deal. Progressives at the time were critical of FDR's New Deal in the 1930s because they said it created modern segregation. It was mostly a program for the white middle class. So I just thought that was ironic to start with. The Green New Deal, which is all about environmental justice is using the Democrat FDR's New Deal, which was been criticized by their fellow progressives for creating modern segregation in the cities by you know only a, basically supporting the white structure. So that was number one. Well, and then also industrialization so that, ended slavery. There's that whole detail. Yeah, they don't met. Yeah, exactly. But I have a whole chapter on identity politics, but that has invaded the climate debate. And it's gotten so wacky now, you know, with lead NASA scientists getting involved in this, blaming white supremacy. But but back to the, the uh, New Deal. So what happened was it's really traceable. It started all to me, even more than Rachel Carson is the Paul Ehrlich and the overpopulation bomb. That's where the progressives really sees where it sort of caught the popular imagination of uh, the public. Much more, much more so, I think, even than Rachel Carson, although that got us worried about, you know, obviously potential pollution and everything. But the Paul Ehrlich, that created a framework for the progressives to essentially say, we're now, we can use the environmental movement to achieve all of our other ends. And that's what's one of the key things here is the Green New Deal is very little about climate and the environment and all about free college education and uh you know, a job if you don't, if you don't, if you want it, environmental justice, you know, all these other non-climate things. But essentially, then you go, I go to the Club of Rome um, and, I, you know, in the, the basis in Malthusianism, the idea that we're all, you know, these, these limits that we can never overcome, which was a big part of John Holdren and Paul Ehrlich. But I think when you get into the sustainable development agenda, the United Nations, I show passages from the UN Rio conference where we, where President H.W. Bush, George Bush, the first George Bush signed on to that convention. Uh, it's almost verbatim, word for word. So it, I think the simplest way of putting it is it's really a borrowing from the United Nations Sustainable Ag Development Agenda, which basically uh, uh, my definition for, for the layperson is sustainable development, the UN, is it's a way that bureaucrats have to literally manage every aspect of your life to ensure that you're earth friendly. And beyond that now, it's to ensure that you're morally and ethically in line with the progressive values. But but essentially the United Nations Earth Charter is what the Green New Deal is now. And then of course, by 2005, you had people like Michael Schellenberger, one of the early authors, you had other people in the New York Times mentioning phrase Green New Deal. And a lot of people consider Obama's, Obama's first green stimulus, the first step in the Green New Deal domestically. So, so by the time Ocasio-Cortez comes by AOC, the Green New Deal has got a long history. It's basically, the environmental movement all in, this is the domestic side on the Green New Deal. Obviously the UN Paris is still the international side, but we're gonna implement the UN Paris domestically through our Green New Deal. But oddly enough, Europe has its own version of the Green New Deal. Australia is getting its own version. So the Green New Deal is popping up all over the world. Um, but essentially the Green New Deal is the environmentalists on every of the old issues, all the old issues, global cooling uh, and resource scarcity and, uh, and uh, the pollution, everything, all in on climate change. And that's what they've decided to do. Uh, and that's where the Green New Deal comes from. And as of right now, uh, the Green New Deal is being implemented stealthily by the Biden administration. We don't even yeah, need it through next, Congress yet. I anticipated yeah. my, my next question, which is how does this relate to the current Congress and administration's plans, including, the, I think they're now lumping a lot of it under, quote, infrastructure. Yeah, they've redefined infrastructure now to essentially be everything climate related, including, you know, environmental justice, but all, all things related to electric cars. I mean, it's they that's just one example. Every agency of Biden's administration is now a climate agency. So you have the State Department, Interior, Department of Defense. Department of Defense is now taking on the whole climate change is going to cause national security. And I point out in the book, it's the exact opposite. First of all, Center for Strategic Study, International, other peer review studies, cold periods have been what's led to conflict. Cold periods have led to you know, resource scarcity and crop failures, which have led to more conflict. Those are the times of wars. Warm periods used to be called climate optimums, the medieval climate, warm period, climate optimum. And so instead of it actually being a threat, it's not, it's actually the other way around. But what it really is a threat are the so-called solutions in, in restricting American energy because that 
puts us back relying on Middle East oil, which means more wars. It puts us relying on Russia, Venezuela. It puts us relying on Chinese rare earth minerals, metals, uh, which are mined in Africa with gross environmental and human rights abuses. So it's a, uh, every agency is implementing it. You have his executive orders. And then there's something else that's happening and that's in the financial sector, the environment, social governance, which Obama administration, I'm sorry, Biden administration is gonna put it on steroids now where if you're a company that wants to invest in any kind of uh, you know, fossil fuel development project, energy project, exploration, mine, it's now gonna be increasingly difficult to ever do that because your social governance score, in other words, your ranking and rating is gonna be taking a hit. You're better, if you wanna virtue signal and invest in solar and wind, then suddenly your score is gonna go up. It's gonna be the ability to banks to lend to you, how government, how government regulates you, taxes you, gives you breaks, subsidizes. I mean, this is, this is where it is. So as a short way of jumping this, I, I sort of end the last chapter angry, frustrated, and you know, lamenting that I think our side's losing in a certain way. And I think, and, and here's the shocking conclusion. We may have lost ground under Trump, the most skeptical US president in US history. We may be worse off in terms of fighting this than we were before him. And I know that sounds weird, but I lay out the case in the book that Trump did fantastic by policy, and even his speeches on energy were great, and even Trump himself on climate, but he, where he failed was cabinet-wide, administration-wide, funding-wide, and narrative-wide. And that's the biggest one. They had an opportunity to set up, and a lot of other people may disagree, but a, a climate committee that would have been headed by Will Happer, 200 peer-reviewed studies, considered the foremost expert on greenhouse gases. And it also would have had Steve Coonan, the Obama-Biden Energy Department physicist. So yeah, a former Democrat physicist, so to speak, co-heading this. Would have been two dozen scientists challenging for the first time at a government level the climate claims of the United Nations, the National Climate Assessment, all these other reports that have come out, it would have been a game changer. It would have been attacked. It would have been controversy. But people in the Trump administration didn't want to deal with it. So in, a, in result is the most skeptical president in U.S. history didn't push back on a darn thing scientific. They didn't stop funding of anything. They didn't stack any federal agencies with skeptics. They tried to in October, November of his last of his first term, which made was like too little, too late, almost a joke at that point. He put in like three scientists. Uh, but it was just none of that. So what's happened is we lost the narrative. All the regulations can be overturned within the first year of Biden. And now you have Republicans rudderless on Capitol Hill, terrified to challenge this. And they're all talking about, well, we'll do carbon capture and storage. We'll plant a trillion trees. That'll be our solution to the Green New Deal. We can't do the Green New Deal. It costs too much. We need a lighter version. You got Murkowski and Romney. So we're in the, one of the lowest points we've ever been in. And I think Trump had the greatest, Trump administration blew the greatest opportunity to actually make a difference and push back on this. Yeah, I mean, my, my, one of my perspectives on this has been that, like, if you're doing a controversial policy that you think is right, and I think their energy and environmental policies were generally very right, like, very right, you, yeah. need, you need to explain it. Yes. You need to explain it. And it, it definitely can't come across as, as like, several things Trump did, at least, or like, okay, like, this is my instinct, or I think this is right, yeah. or I'm just sort of making this decision. Um, because, yeah, that, that, particularly in a whole executive state where, it just everything can be overturned immediately. And then you even set a precedent where, OK, it's just everyone's whim. So, you know, Obama, I think, was one of the yes. of this and then Trump did it a lot. And then Biden is, I think, just taking it to a new level where it's just like, yes. oh, yeah, I decide this. And you know, I don't think it's good to have this pipeline and I don't think it's good to have this offshore drilling and I don't think it's good to have this onshore drilling on federal lands. And it, it just. Yeah. So I, I agree that there wasn't a case. Um, this is a quick sidebar, but I know it's, it's relevant to your book. So you know, I have this energy talking points project that I've been doing. Yes. Um, and so I think one of the upsides of that is I have now have an energy talking points weekly meeting with elected officials. And so I am getting some of the better elected officials, basically all That's Republicans good. at this time, and helping them with the good message. I'm curious, and this is, I know, a promo for me, but how you, I know you, you used at least a dozen of yes. my talking points. So I'm curious how you found that uh, resource. Well, here's why, here's why you're quoted so much uh, in the book, particularly in the energy chapter, which is just devoted to this, because what is lacking are, are, is, is more of Alex Epstein, Epstein. We need 
absolutely we need to simplify all of this down to the level where the politician and the talk radio audience listener to the someone in the crowd can understand and i don't think anyone in america is doing it better than you are in terms of um, on these energy talking points because it is the most needed thing and they were simple so that's why i put a lot of little boxes in with, with some of your best uh quotes and material because if people don't understand something viscerally they're just not going to push it or fight against it, they're going to feel intimidated. And that's where you've got it. This is where on the, on the flip side, the other side had some masterful communication skills, 97% consensus. That means you don't need to know, if you're a climate activist, you don't have to know squat about science. All you need to know is the United Nations is a premier scientific body and that 97% of scientists agree. Now, Al Gore recently upped it to 99 and therefore you're done. But that works. It's effective tool for people, but that's pure propaganda. What you do is actually point out the facts and you present it, but it has the same effect. It gives our side the equivalent, except in an honest, scientific, ethical, and substantive way, the talking points that they've had for so long. And unless the public can understand a concept simply, easily, and explain it in a sentence or two, you've lost the issue. And so, so many energy activists will just go on and you can watch them on C-SPAN. You can watch them, yeah. you know, at, at these conferences and they're just, you know, they're speaking to their, their, their fellow, uh, you know, wonkish, their fellow wonks. They're not speaking to the public. And what we need now is for the public to understand the issue. Awesome. Well, I'm glad it's this is exactly the purpose. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's fascinating what a breakthrough it was for me, because of course I had had quite a bit of success. I had moral case for fossil fuels. I had a lot of speeches, yes. but I would get, you know, people saying, oh, like I need some talking points. And I would, at the end of a speech, I might give them, but it just was a revelation to me that the most important thing is retainability. So you can't just it persuade is. someone in the moment, but they need to retain it so that it's it's so that they carry it going going forward and so then hopefully they can share it with others and so when i came up with this idea okay i'm going to create a site where every single point is referenced powerful but it's short enough to be a tweet like every point on that site basically is, is like literally twitter yes and that, it, yes and it, it has and to it's be amazing how it how it helps and you're seeing you know, a, a good friend of mine made this point which i thought was fascinating about music because i was talking about how we we're talking about music, and I'm going to probably butcher this, but like in terms of music, like the more you can simplify the elements of it, the more popular it can be. That's one thing, yeah. like people need to be able to follow it. But the point he made is that's not just true for people listening to music, it's true for other musicians. Like if you can create elements in music that other musicians can use, then it'll be widespread. And so I thought of this when I saw your book, I'm like, oh, another musician is using it because- Yeah, that's a good analogy. With you, I would use the analogy of Walter Williams, who just passed away, my old economics professor, George Mason. I you mm -hmm. know, quote him in the book as well. His talent, he was obviously a PhD economist, chair of his department, everything, brilliant man, wrote books. But his talent was reducing complex economics to the everyday person could understand. And that's why his column was so popular. That's why he was such a popular on the radio, a TV guest. And I think you're sort of the energy equivalent to Walter Williams because you can get the most complex complex concepts that other people can wonk out on and spend an hour trying to explain. And if you reduce it to Twitter size, that's Walter Williams ask. And that is why I think I quoted you so much in the book. And that is why that's exactly what's needed because the other side has that sophisticated uh, framework, which, it, you know, if you start digging into what they claim, it's all absurd, but it's very effective for them, for their side to understand. Because it, 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 there's the old standard, I, I'm going to talk to Ezra Levon about this. It's the, it's the Starbucks mom, the mom who goes to Starbucks. You want to appeal to them on an emotional and intellectual level. And the gist of that is you can't go to them and say, talk about the UN Paris Agreement and our sovereignty rights and, and et cetera. They're just going to glaze over. But if you start talking to them about American energy dominance and we don't need to go to war anymore and all we're going to be doing is relying even more on China. You want to just personalize it, turn it into points that people can use. That's how you get effectively move the ball on public opinion, which moves public policy. And I think that's why your talking points documents are so important. Let's let, since you mentioned Walter Williams, who is a, a someone I admired a lot, and actually I wrote him and a couple other people, including Thomas Sowell, coming out of college because I had some yeah. examples, and he he and Thomas Sowell both wrote me back with very encouraging letters, which was which is cool. But I think Walter, there's something I want to highlight, and and I'm in part highlighting it because I think you can be a big ally in this. So he was, if you look, I was listening, I kind of went on a binge of his stuff, of his speeches, yeah. four or five weeks ago. So I've probably listened to six hours straight of it, and I was just thinking 
what you're referencing, like, oh my gosh, this guy had like economic talking points and racial talking yes. points. Yes, he, he just, had, yes. And, and I think the two things he does really well. So one are the really clear cause and effect relation uh, explanations, which I think is, is one of the things I do best. But another thing he did that I do sometimes, but I want to do more of, and I hope that you and others can help is he's really good at having these very quick stories like a very succinct story and, that and captures it, yeah. something. And sometimes it's like a power fact, like even I'll use, you know, you know, China, uh, you know, China uses five times as much industrial electricity as the US. So sometimes there's like a power fact, but then he'll have like a story about, okay, this is what happened in South Africa. Like this is how South Africa yeah. is the minimum wage. And I think in energy, what I want to create more of, and what I, I know you're so plugged into the facts, like the more we can have a, like a story that you can at least summarize in a tweet length, then that really sticks with people because they'll know like, oh yeah, Germany, you know, Germany tried to uh, invest heavily in solar and wind and they're, you know, they doubled their electricity prices in 20 years and now they pay three times what, what we pay. Like, yeah. Even something like that, th the other side is so good at that. If you think about, that's what they're doing basically every day. They're creating a narrative with these succinct stories. It's like, oh, well, Greenland just got destroyed and the polar yeah. bears are going was, extinct. And the more we can have this combination of the really clear explanations of how things work, but then the power facts and the really succinct stories, then we can create a whole new mental environment for people. So I'm trying, I'm bringing this up with you because I want to bring in the pro energy movement and help us like sort of co-create this stuff. And if anyone, you know, who's like a good thinker or something, if you ever have something where you think you've done this well, like message me and I'll certainly promote it. Uh, Cause we just need okay. so much more of this than I, you know, that I can create on my own. You do. Uh, in fact, there's one of the other good talking uh, on this issue. Um, Paul Dreesen, David Wojcik had a whole thing, you know, this whole wartime footing uh, for climate, the Green New Deal. People hear this and people, and it resonates like, yeah, we need to fight this like a wartime footing. We've done this before. This is great. We're all in this together. They did a whole analysis, which is, was just devastating. The last thing you'd want to do is go to a wartime footing because you're dealing with rationing, human suffering, uh, and ultimately you know, massive debt and long-term recovery. I mean, that's so that's what they're proposing in order to fight the phantom climate emergency. So whenever you can get with their concepts and flip them on their head like that and expose it in a few sentences, that's another powerful way of doing it. One of the other things people say, well, well, don't you believe in global warming? I'm like, well, yeah, it's definitely warm since the end of the little ice age in 1850. But I go, it's questionable if it's warm since the end of the medieval warm period in 1300. We probably cooled since the Roman warming period of about zero. And I have all the peer reviewed studies and from journals and actually quotes from mainstream media acknowledging it. When you can turn people on their head like that, but yeah, it has warmed. And then it, it's a um, it's a tough challenge though, because as, as I say in the last chapter of the book, even though we have great communication, we have great uh, facts and we have all this, I just feel like we're fighting a battle in which it's a, almost at a battle of, against intimidation and we're losing because politicians on of, of all stripe, stars and stripes here, they literally don't wanna challenge the narrative. And the reason progressives don't mind big business anymore is they're in charge of big business on a whole host of all those what we'll call woke issues. And they just, they dominate. And so this is why I, I, I feel like we need to do something extra. We need a new concept because what we're fighting now, I feel like is a losing battle. They are just rapidly, especially with COVID and lockdowns because they've beaten everyone down so much now. Um, and as an example here, Alex, economically, you'll appreciate this. In 1972, George McGovern ran for president proposing a, a guaranteed income for all Americans. It, it didn't fly. In fact, you know, he lost one of the biggest landslides in U.S. history to Richard Nixon. Well, now, even under President Trump, you collapse the economy through lockdowns. Not saying Trump did, but it was the, the governors. And then how do you solve it? You start having stimulus checks from the government. And now AOC wants one every month, at least. So they're already got the idea of universal basic income started because of poor government policy on lockdowns. So this is how they're just they're just proceeding at rapid pace on all of this. And it's almost like, you know, resisting isn't getting us anywhere at this point, or at least doing the same old things we did. I think I feel like COVID was the game changer. One of the reasons why the Green New Deal is even worse than you think. So I, we had talked before, so you mentioned you wanted to ask me something about that. So what, what would you ask me about? Yeah, well, my question to you as a, as a philosopher in, in philosophy is, how do you fight back against that religious fervor? It's different. It's one thing to just provide facts, cool, dispassionate, great communication. And even if you get certain numbers in the business community, certain numbers of politicians, the overall effect is one of intimidation 
chilling. They don't want to be against the earth. They don't want to be against the, the, the planet. They'll capitulate. We have Western caucus Republicans, all these guys supporting the carbon capture, uh, supporting planting trees, which is, which is actually can go either way in terms of climate. And I show that in the book, but that's fine. But you can't say let's plant trees instead of the Green New Deal. You're implying that you accept the premise and you're just as unscientific claiming trees. So my question to you is, how do you fight something when everything's been on the run? And I'll just bring up the COVID lockdowns. They were just collapsed, even Republican governors. The governor of Texas, who should know better, we got he got praised what three weeks ago for lifting the state's lockdown and mask mandate. What in the world was Texas ever doing that in the first place? It was a group think that overcomes people and they're afraid to dissent. Christy Noem, one of the few, Ron DeSantis, one of the few on the lockdown issue. So I, my question to you is, how do you fight these overwhelming power, the rise of the progressives, the loss of corporate boards, the capitulation of energy companies? I just don't believe facts, persuasion, and you know, good. Uh, common sense can win this anymore. Well, I mean, in some way, persuasion can, because if you could persuade well, against- Persuasion uh, can, but I'm talking about that same method. Yeah, I'm sorry, right, I right. feel like we need something new. We need a new era because we're we're fighting an unprecedented battle of modern times. So here. yeah, let me share, uh, this is a big, big topic in my next book. I'm going to have a lot about this, but I think, you know, it's, it's important, this observation that it's a religion. I mean, you can think of it as a religion yeah. or a philosophy or a framework. And I think the first thing to ask is like, what are the key elements of that religion? And I think there are two basic elements. And so, and they're very related. So I call it like the anti-impact religion or the anti-human impact religion. So it's one is that it's immoral for us to impact the earth. And then two is that it's inevitably self-destructive for us to impact the earth. Yeah. So, and they're related, but they're not the same. So one is just to say, and this is the deep green view that it's just wrong. Like we shouldn't be building buildings. We shouldn't be disturbing wilderness. Like anything we do that impacts the rest of nature, like that has a guilt associated with it. And the more of it, the worse. And then part of the way that goes over uh, is that people are taught that, oh, well, if we keep impacting it because the earth is a delicate nurturer that exists in a delicate balance, our impact is inevitably going to come bite us. And, and you know, you talk about this, I think, some in yeah. chapter six of your book, where it's always the same formula. Like the goal, the end is always, oh, it's totalitarian control. But then the justification is always our human impact is causing some sort of uh, catastrophe. Yes. And the only yes. way out of it is to go to this religion where we just do nothing. And I think the key is to just have like a totally different, I wouldn't call it, it's not a religion because part of it is science-based, but a different framework or different philosophy. And for me, the key thing is like the top value is human flourishing. It's not about wilderness yes. minimizing our impact. It's like human beings flourishing. And you recognize that human flourishing requires intelligent impact on nature because nature is not a delicate nurture, it's wild potential. So it's dynamic, it's uh, deficient, it's dangerous, and we need to intelligently transform it. And if you have that basic philosophy, a couple of things happen. So one is you have a lot of moral confidence in, in industrialization because industrialization is a moral thing. It's the improvement of the human environment. It's like making the world a better place for human beings to live. And the other thing is you have a very strong moral condemnation of the other side. And this is really what I got from Ayn Rand and others when I was 18 on these issues. Cause I, I believed somewhat in climate catastrophe like for a long time. But when I was 18, I learned about the humanistic approach the human flourishing approach. And I learned that human beings survive by transforming our environment. And the green movement says transforming our environment is evil. Therefore, the green movement thinks that human survival and flourishing is evil. Like once I got that, yeah. I knew that this, I had total moral confidence for the rest of my life against the green movement. But if you notice, most Republicans don't have that at all because they buy into the basic framework that impact is bad and impact is inevitably self-destructive. Exactly. So I think it's the core thing is like rewiring it and getting this, getting rid of this idea that impact is bad because it's such a deep, I call it human racism. It's basically anything the human race does is evil. Like you have to totally get rid of that idea and really look at the world from a humanistic perspective. And once you have that philosophy, it totally shapes things. So I'll just, I'm going on a little bit, but I just give one example. No, I like that. That's a, that's a, that's what's called a reframing of the whole debate on the human flourishing. I've always noticed that like animal rights where they say humans aren't allowed to eat animals. And then you say, why? Well, cause you know, we're above that. We have a higher premium. Well, then if that's the case, you say we're equal too with animals. They want animals that have equal rights. Why are animals allowed to eat animals? Somehow then it turns into humans are the only ones they want to regulate. It gets into that weird 
sort of uh, uh, the contradictions of their own philosophy. But I like what you're saying. And how does that, how do you get that on the ground though? Like right now, my concern is there are many good conservatives in Washington on Capitol Hill, I'm talking the federal level, mm -hmm. who are just afraid. And they're, you know, they're going to support massive government boondoggles in the carbon capture. They're going to start doing tree planting and they're going to do, you know, massive investments in solar and wind. Because one thing we know, spending money in Washington is not controversial. So boondoggle projects like carbon capture, boondoggle, solar, wind, no, almost no Republicans will oppose it. None. I mean, I'm just saying there's very few. I don't want to say none, but very few. They're going to pass overwhelmingly. How do you get that message in a way on Capitol Hill that's going to matter for, say, a, a coming debate on the Green New Deal? How do we make it real to them now is the, is the big question. Yeah. So I think of it as I mean, you can almost think of it as three levels, which so one is like the core philosophy. And and it's important that that's fundamental, but it's also, you, OK, there's that's not there's not a direct path from that to, OK, we're going to change the debate in the next month. The second level is the level what I would call our evaluation of fossil fuels. So that's like what Moral Case for Fossil Fuels does in my next book, Fossil Future, I think does a lot better, which is about like, how do we evaluate fossil fuels and its impact on the world? And so that's taking the philosophy, but then integrate and then then uh, uh, then using it to discover and integrate all the different facts. And, and you get into, so if you just take like the global warming issue, when you have a human flourishing framework or human flourishing philosophy, and you don't have this bias against human impact, your whole perspective on, oh, did the earth change one degree and why? Like you stop thinking right. of that as catastrophic at all. And you really are open to, okay, yeah, if we're changing climate at all, maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, maybe it's little bit, but you don't have this kind of assumption that it's morally wrong and must be catastrophic. And then when you look at the nature of it, it's pretty obvious. Like, look, okay, we know that it greens a lot and that all things be equal is good. We know that warming is generally desirable, particularly because global warming is polar warming. It occurs more in the cold places than in the warm places. And this has been desirable throughout history. You mentioned the point about an optimum. So if you start getting people to take a humanistic perspective, it's not a, we've been caught in this thing where it's like one side says the science and then we challenge the science, but it's right. about their philosophical interpretation of science. Because even if you say like, oh, it's going to warm three degrees in the next eight years, which I really doubt. But it's like the idea that that yeah. would be a catastrophe that justifies disempowering, like that should be a non-starter. So I think the force well, helps us take a totally different look at quote, the science, because we're looking at the earth from a human flourishing perspective. And if that were true, like who cares about three degrees? Yeah, and Green Fund, I try to make the argument that if we actually face the climate emergency, just set aside the science and accept it, the last thing you'd want to do is a Green New Deal that centrally plans every aspect yeah, of our lives right. and power bureaucrats crush, because you'd want market economy, you want creativity, innovation, technology, you want to have human, as you're saying, human flourishing exploding. And so it's the exact opposite. And that seems to resonate with people when you explain it, because rather than arguing, because you, you do want to argue whether we're having a climate emergency, that's still important. There's so many things coming at you. But I use COVID. Now, Larry Kudlow is an example in the book, a fantastic guy, Trump's economic advisor, Larry Kudlow, understands economics, helped engineer the Trump that had the lowest, you know, black and Hispanic unemployment. But he failed to, in my assessment, I mentioned this in the book, he failed two key narrative functions that put Trump completely off the off the scent of the administration. One of them was on COVID. They came out and the keep, keep in mind, I, may, I go through a whole section on COVID climate connection. And it's interesting because if you're worried about, if you use the phrase human flourishing, people would argue then you want as much COVID restriction. They'll, they'll use that kind of concept. This is about humans first and we need to lock everyone down to protect them all. I wouldn't all. say flourishing. No, it's more like- well, Not flourishing, saving, but protection is, yeah. Saving lives. Yeah, but- Saving lives. Sure okay. Human flourishing, doing nothing for a year is a problem. Exactly. Yeah. But that was their success. So that what happened was the left then, instead of arguing about saving the earth, they were arguing about saving grandma and we need to save everyone. There's going to be death tolls that exceed the Spanish flu. Well, what happened was the Trump administration accepted the World Health Organization, which is chiefly controlled by China, all these recommendations, which had never existed in previous public health, the idea of the lockdown. They do it. Even in late, man, I quote Larry Kudlow in the book. He was on CNBC and he says, you know, I don't know when we're going to open the economy up. That's sort of up to the health community, the doctors, they'll let us know. At that point, Trump administration had ceded the entire presidency success, economics on 
the medical community, the Fauci, CDC, World Health Organization. What a challenge. And at the time, I was screaming with Trump administration. I was against everything from the beginning. I had followed the CDC for decades. I'd read Michael Fomento's Myth of Heterosexual AIDS. I'd followed what Fauci did. I knew what they did on vaping issue. So I knew the CDC was not about, you know, you can't take what they say on face value. It's a politicized organization. They don't present the science. I was scared. All the Trump people would come back. Well, they've got to follow this. If they, they, otherwise, Trump will be blamed for all these deaths. Well, guess what? He followed the Fauci CDC and he ended up still getting blamed. But Fau but but um, Kudlow actually saying we can't open up until the doctors tell us was shocking. The next thing that happened, I point this out in the book, is Trump approved this climate committee, which, again, would have been the first federal government report pushing back in the United Nations. Of course, it would have been a big effing political mess. There would have been attacks, deniers, evil, who are these signs? But it would have been the most necessary thing. It would have given judges cover when they're fighting these kids' lawsuits and all sorts of lawsuits on climate. Instead of just having the UN or National Climate Assessment written by Obama holdovers or you know, Union of Concerned Scientists, they would have had another federal report, or at least with the a presidential committee report, didn't happen. So Kudlow in the book, in my book, I quote him, he brags it, uh, uh, he, he doesn't brag, but he was opposed to this climate committee. And I just met him recently at CPAC. And he said that he Trump got it and he told Trump not to do it because basically it was a distraction. And in the book, I say a lot of Republicans see it as a quagmire like Vietnam War. Why would we want to deal with the science? Well, there's a lot of reasons you'd want to deal with the science. But my point is on those two key narratives, Larry Kudlow, as it, representing the Trump administration, failed to challenge the COVID narrative, failed to challenge the climate narrative. What did it lead to? It led to Trump tanking the economy, allowing the framework, which then led to his loss of the election. And on climate, it led to no pushback, the most skeptical president having no push. And now we're just stuck with Biden coming in, roughshodding it, and Republicans really, truly running scared. I mean, other than Ted Cruz and Rand Paul and Senator James Inhofe, who I used to work for, I can't think of many on Capitol Hill in the Senate side. You can't even, remember you testified in front of the EPW. I don't think there's a single committee in the Senate that would even have a skeptical scientist or uh, someone even skeptical of, of the science up here anymore. Only the House has a few committees left. That's how much the Republicans have shifted just in recent years. They've just, they're, we're hurting here in terms of political fight back. Okay, well, that, okay, there's a ton of issues there, and um, yeah. I think we'd probably agree on on a lot of the COVID stuff, particularly about the policy. We might disagree on on others, but I want to bring it back to so even when we're talking about, I think actually this applies to both. Where I think there's a conflation that the other side does of two things: one is like the state of the science on something, and the yeah. other is how you evaluate how you evaluate the state of the world and the state of policy. So if you I'll, let's just take climate. So if it's, it's, I think it's a mistake that we often get positioned as, okay, the climate scientists are saying something and then we're quote skeptical of it because the real, the real issue is, is there some catastrophe or apocalypse that justifies depriving billions of people of the only cost effective source of energy? Like that's really what the yeah. issue is because the benefits of fossil fuels are so fundamental to everything good. Uh, in the world that is so needed by billions more people. Like, it's not like, it, so it's it really, sh the, the burden of proof is hugely on the other side. It's really like, is there an apocalypse? Not, is there change? But it's been, the other side wants to position it as, if there's any change, then we need to get rid of fossil fuels. And so it's been positioned as, okay, some people believe in some man-made change, and then others are just totally skeptical of all of it. Whereas I would think of it as like, it's really like, do you take a pro-human or an anti-human perspective? Right on climate. And so I think that there's a wide range of climate science claims that if you take the humanist perspective on it, there's no justification whatsoever for restricting CO2 at all, let alone a, a totalitarian yeah. green new deal. Oh, just one more thing about that, because sure. I know we're running short on time, is uh, so if I think of it as like the top level for me is the like, human flourishing framework, and then there's the pro-human evaluation of fossil fuels and climate. And then beyond that, though, is the third level is energy talking points. So the idea of energy talking points is it's taking that framework and that approach and applying it to every issue so that the elected officials have the talking points they need. And so part of what I'm doing now is just building it out on every issue, you know, carbon tax and Clean Future Act. And it's, it's just giving them the words they need when they need them, but coming from the right framework, but in a way where it's hard to argue with. And one of the things that you sort of indicated is you, you, you mentioned that like if you actually cared about if there were actually a climate catastrophe, 
like, let's just put it as if you're actually concerned at all about reducing CO2 emissions, you would not take a totalitarian approach. You would take a liberating yes. approach, just like, by the way, if you were really concerned about a virus, you would liberate the hell out of the medical profession so that we could develop yeah. vaccines quickly. You wouldn't lock everyone down because freedom is what allows us to fight against natural threats like uh like COVID. So I think if, if you, and, and so in, in fossil fuels, like I make a big focus out of the Republicans should be talking about decriminalizing nuclear. Like that should be their whole focus. All this other stuff yeah. is worthless. There's no basis for it. It just, it just it increases China's uh, status relative to us in all kinds of ways that we're being useful idiots. But there is this thing called nuclear energy that we could actually take the lead in that would actually produce a lot of energy without a lot of CO2. And so I think that's the kind of thing where energy talking points is trying to take these high level things and make them very concretely useful where the politician can actually win politically by doing the right thing versus, yeah, let's plant a trillion trees, which, by the way, is that really good when you're worried about forest fires and you have bad forest fire <laughs> management? They're just going to create a whole bunch of potential like, no, don't do that. Decriminalize nuclear and liberate America to keep making the world a better place. I agree. Now, I mentioned you know, the, I, the COVID climate connection. COVID is a microcosm in a sense of what's going on in climate. But look at what happened because still, I still say what you're saying is great. However, there's a point when it just, it, the hysteria is so overwhelming. Look back at what the virus and how we got to the lockdowns. Imagine if President Trump had stood up. It would, the amount of courage it would have been for him to actually stand up and not allow Fauci to run Russia, not allow all these governors to, you know, it shouldn't sit, not allow, he set up the framework for these governors to shut down. It would have been, you would have been a monster. And so this takes a level of courage in fighting this unbelievable hysteria because you had a terrified public. You had terrified politicians of politics and you had the World Health Organization just going full bore. This is what they're trying to do. It's kind of like a school shooting. You know, when a school shooting happens, the gun control advocates pounce with legislation. At some point, there's going to be school shootings, some school shootings so horrific that Republicans are going to just feel too intimidated not to vote for some gun control because it's a it's a fear factor. It's emotional. It, they control all these institutions. So I guess I'm still going back to my point. It takes we need we need something beyond you know rational thought and but, but fight it, and it, facts. But here's the, the framing so just one more thing i'll say because there are a lot of disanalogies i think uh with covid because it's like a it is a ne really negative thing which is totally different than climate where we don't where we have declining climate related deaths right yes we didn't have yes declining virus related deaths in 20 no no they were going up yeah exactly yeah, so but you look at i think the parallel is this you need a clear framework and what was happening is what mm. i would call the you know pseudoscientific statist establishment, like on COVID, you know, they, and even like, it was really China set the model, China set the framework because the CDC was going, everyone was going against what the CDC recommended just a couple of years ago in terms of mostly voluntary measures. But I think what you'd have to have, and I don't think Trump had a lot of credibility on this because I don't think he was very good uh, at no. a bunch of the initial competent stuff and even shutting. So there's a whole bunch on there, but the basic thing you have to say, you have to have like a real perspective that somehow takes into account this concern, but says, no, here is the path to human flourishing. And even part of it would have been, look, look, this is a virus. The freedom is key for dealing with a virus because we need the producers to be as free as possible yeah. to combat this thing. We're not just going to sit in our homes and everything's going to go away. We have to actually produce cures to this. And so I'm going to liberate the FDA. Like, you know, I think the Moderna vaccine was available in one form in January of 2020. Like, People are going to be free to, we're going to like liberate testing. He still kept the government in charge of testing, which still remains like we're going to liberate this. And on the other side, yeah, the government cannot figure out, the government can legitimately say, look, if you are demonstrably infectious and like you are a threat to others for this 14 day period, yes, we can tell you to quarantine. Otherwise, we don't have a right to do that. You're innocent until proven guilty, but you have a responsibility to judge what's best for your life. Like, and that's what's actually going to allow us to pull through instead of screwing over all the poor and middle class people and ruining their like if you had put that if it's not like he had this clear view or the Republicans had this clear view with confidence and then they just failed to articulate it. They didn't have the view. And so this is no, I agree with you. They did climate is if you give them the clear view in all the details, then you have a then you have a chance. But if it's just we're accepting the other framework and then we're going to quibble about different things, and particularly if we're quibbling on the scientific stuff where we might have the least credibility, then it, people are going to say, oh, yeah, well, this is basically right. And yeah, maybe Epstein or Murano is right about this or not. But yeah, we got to save as the government, 
The government's job is to use as much force as it needs to save as many lives as possible. That's what it is on COVID or on climate. It's the government's job is to eliminate CO2 emissions at all costs. Like if we if we get rid of those frameworks and have an alternative and have it in all have it fleshed out in all its details, I think then we have it's like the music. Like okay, we we can have an orchestra or a, a yeah. choir that that can actually say effective things instead of just reacting to their orchestra. Yes, uh, I just was on it. I sort of the the last second to last chapter of my book, Green Fraud. I go into what's coming, and COVID has really enacted a lot of potential. First of all, all the climate activists are jealous about the lockdowns. You have everyone from John Kerry to Greta Thunberg to Al Gore to the UN officials, all saying essentially, if we can lock down the planet for a virus, we can do it for climate. John Kerry says the so solutions are eerily similar. Jane Fonda said it best. COVID is God's gift to the left because it set up this framework that you need essentially totalitarianism that Americans have never felt as a general wide population in their history. Now we've had slavery, segregation, Japanese internment against segments, but in terms of a general wide population, I don't think there's anything in American history that has been prolonged and is liberty restricting as a lockdown. But essentially they want the idea of government telling you how many people can be on your on your back deck, uh, how many people can be at a funeral, whether you can be at home at curfew. You have to justify what is an essential reason. They want to transform that over to the climate uh, debate. And I yeah. actually have uh, Eric Holtheis, a climate activist, quoted in the book as saying, you know, and under a climate emergency, you won't be able to fly when it's morally justifiable. So we're going to be fighting this on an ideological level, this religious fervor, but also with what the Biden administration is doing, every aspect of life is going to be under climate. I mean, we have the department, they're going to now add climate change to our death certificates, Alex. That's the emotional. Imagine CNN with a death ticker. Bill Gates is on record as saying climate change death toll will exceed anything that came from, from uh, the virus by many more orders of magnitude. He said so, that? He did. He said he said that he didn't say the death certificate, but he said climate the death toll from climate change will be much higher than anything from a virus. It's in I believe I have it in the book. If not, it's on my website report, which I may have updated. But I think it's in that quotes in the book. And what they're doing, though, is by by redefining climate change death. They're, we have Department of Transportation who says fatal car accidents are up due to global warming. American Cancer Society said cancer is up due to global warming. Al Gore says every organ of your body is impacted by global warming, climate change. So that means if you die from organ failure, cancer, or in a fatal car crash, you can have climate change listed on your death certificate. We are just fighting this from so many different levels, and they have now unprecedented power. I think Scott Atlas said it best recently. Two things we learned is the American public, uh, we never knew government could control us this like this ever before, and we never knew people would be as accepting as this before. Those are two scary lessons we learned. And also the UK House of Commons said he, he was amazed at how compliant the public was under COVID lockdowns. He wants to move to a version of climate lockdowns. We already have these specifically people comparing this. A professor named Marcuse, which I quote in the book, wants to literally have, uh, you know, restrictions on travel all under a declared climate emergency same kind of things we're talking about like the uk power chief energy only when it's available so we are in the battle of the future of america it goes well beyond climate and that uh, climate and energy so i agree with you on flipping this frame i think one of the areas we should collaborate in all of us pro energy is on kids right now because i have a whole chapter on how they've been indoctrinated from kindergarten through college they're suing the government trying to get a livable climate Maybe that's what we, I've been toying with the idea for years of starting a, a high school and elementary school curriculum on climate, energy, and the environment and offering it to private schools, obviously, and, uh, and but also to public schools who are willing to go rogue and get off the common core nonsense that kids are being taught with no dissent. So it's something to think about, maybe targeting your points to kids. That's what I'm going to start focusing on, I think, more and more because kids are being just we're losing a generation of a, a whole series of kids that are just being indoctrinated, particularly public school kids. That's my soapbox. Well, that's uh, <laughs> well, you know, part of the reason I want to bring you on is just because you have, the, I think, a very concrete understanding of the reality of this movement. And it is an ominous movement. And there's no I mean, I, I have a lot of stuff I'm doing that's strategic against it. But it's important to recognize, like, this is a massive thing that we're up against. It's a very anti-American thing. It's a very anti-freedom thing. And I do- It's anti-freedom and human. It really yeah, is. In the, yeah, and, and you certainly like the, the, the acquiescence to just, you know, what I call like indefinite universal isolation, just being forced, like quarantine for the, the healthy. 
basically. And, and just that there's yeah. no idea of innocent until proven guilty. Like that idea, I had a tweet about this months ago, like call me old fashioned, but I thought the government had to have evidence. Before. That's right, before they lock you down. <laughs> like, so I, I think again, it's really about having the positive alternative, having a positive framework that we're confident in. And I think so much of the American, just the American framework of just freedom and the value of that and innocent until proven guilty was lost and people thought, oh, well, the constitution has no way to handle this. It's like, as if her ancestors didn't deal with far worse pandemics all the time. Like life was a pandemic in many ways back yeah. then, but they still understood, well, okay, you need freedom. You need to be able to make these decisions, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, Mark, I'm, I'm grateful to you for uh, exposing and creating so much awareness of this. Let's just make sure. So the book is Green Fraud. They can get that anywhere. Where can people find you and follow you? I'm at climatedepot.com and also the book climate activists from daily coast and a couple other places are, are going after Amazon to pull the book because Amazon is supposed to be a climate champion, but they shouldn't be selling books by climate deniers or anyone opposed to the green new deal. So, you know, Amazon has pulled similar books under similar pressure. So we'll see what happens, but right now it's still available on Amazon. Mark Stein wrote the forward. He's making it available on his website as well. And he'll sign any copies if people buy it there. It's also available at cfact.org. So, uh, yeah, so and also CFAC, Walmart. And, yeah. Interesting historical anecdote. The first organization that ever hired me to speak when I started the Center for Industrial Progress. Yeah, there you go. have a, a, a warm spot in my heart. All right, Mark, uh, great to see you. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks again to Mark Morono for joining me on the show. Uh, covered a lot of stuff. Um, if you want to go back to more of my views on the COVID stuff, which I think are some overlap with Mark, but others we would differ on, you can go back to the old Power Hour episodes, maybe March, April, May last year. And I still stand by much of what I said there, particularly in terms of the, the principles of government. I, I definitely just keep want to keep stressing that the pro-freedom side needs a clear, positive framework, both in terms of values, uh, assumptions, as well as policies where we're really confident what we believe, why it's right, and we're really confident in why the other side is wrong. That is the precondition, and then applying that to all the different concrete issues and empowering allies, I think, is the ticket to success. It's not an easy ticket, but it's the only way I know of, and I'm seeing results, so I'm going to continue on this path. All right, let's wrap up. Or speaking of seeing results, if you want to help with these results, you can uh, become an accelerator. Go to industrialprogress.com slash accelerate and support our research and development efforts and our promotional efforts at the Center for Industrial Progress. As always, if you have any questions, comments, love mail, or hate mail, you can email me at alex at alexepstein.com. Let's see what else. Newsletter, alexepsteinlist.com. Uh, check out energytalkingpoints.com. have a ton of new content up there. And I think that is it for this week. So hope you enjoyed this week's discussion. Hope you're motivated to share energytalkingpoints.com with new people. And I will be back next week. I've got the next five Power Hour guests lined up. Very excited about all of them. So lots of good stuff in store. I'll be back next week with a great guest that you'll learn about then. Until then, I'm Alex Epstein. This has been Power Hour. Power Hour. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of energy. Power Hour, the antidote to shallow thinking about energy issues.